I just wanted to welcome everybody to the latest Global Studio event. And um, I wanted to also give everyone a heads up that the sketching school is going to be postponed until probably mid-January. Um, we're just, we're really trying to fundamentally make uh, changes to it and present it in a way that's really in, um, in, in right relations with other worldviews and perspectives. And we're just finding that that's to do that properly is taking longer than we thought it would, and which is a good lesson for us to learn. And uh, so I just wanted to give everyone a heads up because I've been getting lots of uh, questions about because people are excited for it. And uh, so it will for sure happen. Um, it's just going to be a little bit later. And then I also just wanted to do a land acknowledgement before I hand it over to Adria. Um, I'm privileged to look out at a beautiful lake on lands formerly known as the Salish region of Turtle Island, today known as interior British Columbia within the political boundaries of Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm a fifth generation white settler now living and working as an uninvited guest on the lands of the Sequetmec Nation. I'm a squatter on these lands. The region was not negotiated by treaty and remains to this day unseated. Immediately around where I stay, this includes the people of the Splatchin, Nisconlet, and Squilax bands. Kuxjam, or thank you. A Splatchin band council member described the Sequetmec traditional lands to me as roughly defined by this Shushwap Lake watershed and that it has been occupied since time immemorial by the nation's diverse cultures. There's archeological evidence of their presence dating back over 15,000 years. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the ancestors and people of these bands for their acts and ongoing inclusive activities towards healing and conciliation and in the defense of the land, water, and creatures of this region. I also live and work in Egoli or Johannesburg, South Africa, on veld that is traditional lands of the San and the Soto Tuana peoples. Significant gold deposits were discovered in both these locations within four years of each other in the mid 1850s, triggering colonial mechanisms of land appropriation Displacement, displacement of communities thousands of years old, cultural assimil assimilation, and imperial resource extraction. And I'd also like to ask if we could all just kind of take a breath because as I was reviewing the last film, I realized I, we just like jumped from land acknowledgement to the next thing and it made it seem very kind of performative. And um, I just, I for myself anyway, need to kind of take a breath and before we move on. Okay, Adria, if you'd like to introduce the rest of uh, the workshop, which I, for one, am super excited um, to be participating in. And I'm sure. really looking forward to, to uh, Francesca. Okay. Um, so hello and welcome everyone to the second Supernatural TV workshop. I'm Adrian Maynard and I am one of the organizers behind the Supernatural Project. We are a registered nonprofit and we're also graduate architecture students at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which Supernatural works as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq. We strive for respectful relationships with all the people of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. We stand with the water protectors of this land. If you have the means, please support their vital network. We will drop a link in the chat for the Treaty Truck House Legal Fund. I want to begin by expressing gratitude to Kristen Cornieco, Douglas McLeod, and the whole Global Studio community for all that they do. Our workshop series would not be possible without their vision and their dedication. And we are so grateful to be a part of this amazing project. I'd also like to acknowledge the work of uh, Laura Nolte, whose innovation and hard work has brought the Supernatural TV project and workshop to life and brought it off the ground. Over the past few months, um, our group has had a number of inspiring conversations with Kristen about the rapidly evolving field of architecture. Many of these conversations have centered around the importance of democratizing knowledge, experimenting with modes of communication and centering voices that are often marginalized. In her own architectural practice, with, uh, and with 1950 
five films, Kristen has turned to film to share knowledge and, and engage, pushing the boundaries as far as releasing one of the first peer reviewed documentaries. These conversations have became the seeds of the Supernatural TV project. As architecture students that have been frustrated with the limits of our curriculum in a time of climate change and social inequity, we have often wondered what conversations were being had beyond the walls of our own studio at Dalhousie. We were curious about what was happening at other architecture schools, what they were doing to address these issues, and wondered how we could share ideas quickly with a much larger community. Thus, the emergence of Supernatural TV. We want to create a platform that everyone could contribute their ideas to through experimental film, DIY documentaries, and even their design projects and processes. Over the last few months, we will be, or over the next few months, we will be launching this platform and we'll be inviting you all to contribute. It will be an experiment. It might even be fun, who knows? Uh, it will also, it might also change the way we think about architecture and sharing knowledge. The next few workshops we will be leading will be centered on developing film, skill, film skills. Um, our previous one and on the weekend was with um, Abner Collette, which was more about DIY film taking, uh, filmmaking techniques. Um, and this one, uh, we, this is our second one with Francesca. Um, and I guess without further ado, I can, um, I'll let Francesca um, Akuyasi introduce herself. So thanks very much, uh, Francesca, for joining us and for leading us through this. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thank you, Laura, for asking me to be here. I definitely feel a bit nervous because um, I haven't had many chances to talk about DIY filmmaking, um, even though that's my favorite. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a writer and an artist and in recent years, my like, artistic practice separate from writing has been very film focused. Um, because I find that to be an excellent way to tell stories. Um, not always the most accessible to create because you need stuff where <laughs> with writing, you just a pen and paper or, you know, but with filmmaking, you, you do need stuff. Um, but what I've learned, what I've been learning and why I'm excited to be here is because there's ways to make it happen with things in your immediate um, reach sometimes. Um, so I have my notes are kind of divided into two. Um, I want to talk to you about um, the process of making one sort of professionally produced um, short documentary, which um, by professionally produced, I mean, I got a grant <laughs> to, uh, for post-production, um, but the original seed of the idea and the groundwork to get uh, participants, all of that was pretty DIY. <laughs> uh, and then I want to talk about another project I'm working on right now for Nocturne, which is for folks who don't live in Halifax or Nova Scotia. Nocturne is sort of a citywide art festival that happens over the course of a few days, uh, primarily at night. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm working on an experimental, like a video project which is a completely different process than the, the one I'm going to show you right now. Um, but before I show you anything, I wanted to say like, I am really into us having a conversation for folks who feel comfortable. I know that we've been doing Zoom for almost two years now. It doesn't make it any less like, <laughs> I'm still very, awkward <laughs> and we can't really feel each other we can barely see each other um so if you'd like to say something or ask something or need clarification please feel free to just do it um yeah so i'm going to show you a film it's 12 minutes <laughs> and it's a few years old um but it's like the my most professionally produced dark um and it's an interview style which is one of the main things i want to talk about like in, like how to um develop rapport or and basically have to get people to talk to you about things in their heart um and so that as well as storyboarding are the two things i want to talk about regarding this um this film so i'm going to play it now it's 12 minutes and if the audio is too intense or anything, let me know. I can control it from here, I think. Um, 
and I don't think there's anything potentially upsetting. <laughs> it's an interview. It's like three different interviews with three different uh, Black artists based in Halifax. So I'll go ahead and play that now. I am Liliana Abrebe Wihanko Korman. My full name is complex, and that kind of speaks to where I'm from and who I am. The simple answer is that I'm from Ghana, but I am very much biracial and definitely identify that way. My dad is from Ghana, my mom's from the Philippines. I grew up in Kenya, Zimbabwe, the States and Ghana. I carried all those influences with me. I will say that I'm a contemporary African dance artist living in so many different places, having so many different experiences, my practice has a lot of different influences. One of the things that has always been true about me is that I both belong to communities and also live in the spaces between communities. Definitely being Black is a big part of my art and it has become increasingly so as my art and my practice have developed. Part of that is the specificity of living in Nova Scotia and the racial histories that are so strong and present in this country. I often say to people that I get more Black the longer I live in Nova Scotia what it means to be Black in Africa. And it's not like we don't have racism in various parts of Africa. I, I grew up in Zimbabwe where there is plenty of racism, but the way racism presents in the Nova Scotian context is different. I think there are a lot of tensions that exist within the various Black communities, tensions that exist between African Nova Scotians, Africans from the continent, tensions that exist between Africans from the continent and people from the African diaspora. Belonging to me like, means being able to bring your whole self, all the parts of yourself, all the different pieces, the messy, complex pieces. But I think there's also something really important about being seen. Um, being seen and valued and held in a community is a really big part of belonging. Um, so I belong more on some days than I do on others. So I think I move in and out of belonging. The more I'm in relationship with people, the more I am in touch with myself and my body and my body on this land, the more I feel like I belong. At a young age, I realized I'm probably not going to be the best basketball player amongst my friends, but I was most certainly going to be the best writer. My name is Maje. I am a hip hop artist living in Halifax, and I'm from a predominantly black community called East Preston. Yeah, I'm 27 years old. Why I live in the North End, why I love the North End. First of all, my studio is in the North End, so on Goddard and on the corner of Goddard and in Uniac. It just became like family to me. Like really, like being over here for like, what is it, like six or seven years, just became like, it's like a second East Preston to me, so that's a big deal. My art 
is words, I would say. Not strictly just music, I would say my art is words. Like, I'm always that guy even like making puns or like, you know, puns is jokes, like dad jokes, really bad jokes. But like English class was a breeze for me. I often hear like my friends say, oh, I got to write an essay and I'm just like, my, my brain's going off because I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. I would love to write an essay. Uh, well, I wouldn't like to go to school, but yeah. <laughs> Just writing, just words, I feel like, is my art. It's so funny because I'm very introverted, so I don't say much, but like, words are everything. Yeah, making, making all, all your own, own money, so I know you won't need mine. We should get us matching watches, think about it all the time. While I'm working, you be twerking, you don't do it for the vine. Do it for the realism, the realism, the one time. I would just rap all the time. My friends would do other things, they would play basketball, they would do this, they would do that, and I would just write all the time everyone knew he was the rapper he was that guy with the with the with the dope lines or like ask him a freestyle ask him a freestyle like i was that guy like my whole like all my years in junior high and high school i was that guy and you gonna make me make me forget all of us sierra you gonna make me make me forget all of us sierra i want to get into writing like blogs and stuff like something for the introverts out there i've already started a book my book is about the ways that my mom made me an entrepreneur without like intentionally trying. So like, just like the way she raised me, like the strictness and like, just like, there's so, so many lessons within lessons. And yeah, I just wanted to like, show some gratitude to my mom. It's weird, cause like, until I moved from East Preston, I've never felt like an outsider. For like living in Halifax, it's tough. Um, but it's better to be aware of the hurdles that you're going to have to climb. So I'm very glad that I'm super aware. Even as a kid, my mom would be like, do you realize you're a, a little black boy? Like, do you realize that, like, it's not going to be easy? Like, you need to, like, she had me competing with, like, the white kids in my class. Like, it was like, you have to be the best version of yourself times two. Belonging for me is so precious because I was put in a position where I, like, I don't want to say nobody wanted me, but my biologicals were incapable of making me feel like I belonged. So, you know, a, another family stepped up. So that's a big deal. That represents a lot of who I am. And it's all we are, we are. The people I'm around, I hold them dearly to me. Not everybody can get this trust, not everybody can get, you know what I mean, the best version of Maje. Really, it's everything. If you don't feel like you belong, you need to change that environment. That's why ownership is very important to me, because if it's yours, it's yours and nobody else's, you know what I mean? Lots of people don't belong. No one feels all the time like they belong. We push away difference. We don't celebrate people enough or at all or until they're dead. I'm over that. Let me tell you about that. My name is Kate McDonald and I was born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The Magic Project is a non for profit organization that aims to use art and photography to showcase the brilliance of marginalized communities and the multitude of brilliance within those marginalized communities. It was born out of Donald Trump's election. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everyone that I knew was super angry. And I think it's easy when you're feeling those emotions in big ways to become stagnant. And that's not what I wanted to do. So uh, it was kind of like looking at the internet and Black Girls Are Magic kind of just had taken off really. So I was like, we should do one here. Oldest oh, black community in Canada. We should probably play, pay some homage to the um, women who have come before us. I also started this with Emma Paulson, who's another artist who's not from here, but um, has been creating art locally here. And like, do we do a lot of things together. 
But yeah, so it started with Black Girls on Magic. That went crazy. Then there was a snowstorm, and we were gonna do Black Kings Are Magic. And that was actually amazing. Um, some of the people, we had just had a handful of people that showed up. It was very beautiful. And then Queer People Are Magic happened. Then we did Queer People Are Magic 2.0 at Pride. One of the key things about the Magic Project is that your identity, like you don't have to explain it. You don't have to, you don't have to explain it. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to watch what you say about yourself. You don't have to hide parts of yourself. <clears throat> That doesn't exist in the spaces that I try to create. And I think that, that that's a W. That's a win, for sure. I was adopted into a white family. I didn't grow up with black family at all. Uh, it was made for a very interesting childhood, into very white schools. Um, yeah, made for a really interesting childhood. I don't necessarily know that I can answer if I belong, as much as the communities could. <laughs> if I'm not like serving my community, if I'm not speaking in a way that feels representative of the communities that I'm a part of, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? Which is complicated, but I think I belong. I mean, I don't know. Do I care? Like, I don't know. Are we supposed to care <laughs> at the end of the day? I want to do what I want to do anyways. And I don't think I'll ever fully belong in one place. I never have. I don't know. I think so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, okay. I haven't seen that since 2019, so I was just like going down memory lane. <laughs> that was so, thank so you wonderful. For watching that with me. <laughs> thank you. Um, Thank you for showing us. Yeah, it's such a such a treat. And while I was watching it, all of us together, and I was remembering, it was just great. I'm glad we did that because now I'm like, oh yes, I want to talk about just like the relational aspect. So I like to do interview style documentaries because I want to hear people's stories for themselves. Oh, Ashley, excellent question. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, they do. I will drop all the socials I can find in the chat, uh, because they definitely do. Um, but, oh, let's see. but yeah, the I really like interview style documentaries because I want to hear people's stories from, you know, in their own voices when possible. Um, and I made this because I was feeling quite lonely. Like I went to grad school in Nova Scotia and I went to St. Mary's, which is a very Converse. Um, but the moment I left campus, I just, I, I'm from elsewhere, I'm from Nigeria, I'm very much a settler. Um, and I was looking for Black community. Um, and so I started something called Black in Halifax, which you can find in, in YouTube. It's like shaky camera, terrible audio, but it meant so much to me. And so with that idea, I applied for the Filmmakers Assistance Program at uh, National Film Board um, and made this. Um, but I basically scammed those people into becoming my friend in an ethical way, <laughs> which like you you can do that if you want or, or or you can't. What I mean is, I think it's very I I wouldn't be so vulnerable with a camera in my face. Any camera, it takes um, time and finessing, <laughs> and so each each person that I interviewed, all those three people. I met with them multiple times and there was very much, I met with them to tell them the idea and to invite them. And I shared the kind of questions I was going to ask. And we just had multiple conversations where it had to be an exchange. The level of vulnerability that Maje and Kate Mack and even Liliona, the level of vulnerability they shared on camera with me um, didn't happen out of nowhere. Um, and so for folks who are interested in like interviewing people, I know there's different styles and techniques and, and I'm sure like film schools have like a whole procedure, but what I've done as like a complete novice DIY person is just establish relationships. And, um, and I give folks a very wide window to, for consent. <laughs> um, so of course I, I have people sign releases 
but I let them know they have up until a certain time to withdraw if they'd like. I let folks see the rough draft and the rough cut and the final cut um, because I know in person when I'm having a conversation, there might be things I say that I don't necessarily want other people to hear and I don't realize until I see it played back. And so that's important to me, um, which can be tricky if you're not making a very like tender hearted identity focused piece, right? Like if you're doing investigative journalism or interviewing people where there is a bit of combativeness or where you are wanting to get at the truth that they may not be willing to give. In that case, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the right way to approach that. Um, the kind of storytelling I'm interested in is the in 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 their own voices. You know, people sharing what they want to share. Um, so not investigative at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was an exchange. There's always an exchange, and there's time and commitment. Um, another project I did in 2019 before lockdown uh, as a residency was a queerness and faith um, interview style. Like. It, it was screened at the, the an art opening, so it wasn't necessarily like the production value is nothing compared to this. It is shaky camera, but it's folks cooking and telling me, queer people cooking and telling me about their faith practice. Uh, and similar to this style, we did have to meet several times and we had to build a level of trust. Um, and I guess that's what I'm getting at is trust. Um, having your the people you're interviewing be able to trust that you will, they will not be misrepresented um, and that their stories are safe in your care. Um, that is really, I guess, the, the most important thing for me. Um, and so for this one, because it ended up being like proper and not just shaky on YouTube, like I don't even own the rights to this because I, for better or worse, kind of got myself in a situation with the, with the um, a foundation who, anyways, but it meant I had to storyboard it properly and and have everything kind of done professionally, which is a great experience, but it's not necessarily how I want to work. So for this piece, I storyboarded every single scene. Um, not, not the conversation, just the aesthetics, right? Like just what I wanted it to look like. So where I wanted people to sit, what I wanted the light to look like, not necessarily what they would say because that is always a surprise. Um, I didn't know that Maje would um, would divulge that they that he was adopted. I didn't know that Kate would have a moment of like uh, like tears in her eyes. You know, that was just it happened because there was a space for it. Um, but the scenes were storyboarded <laughs> to save time or just for efficiency. Um, if that's your way, I think a lot of people require that, then please do it. My storyboards are very, very basic. Um, stick figures and like just bullet points of what, you know, bullet point descriptions. Um, I think the more um, detailed they are, the better. But, you know, I'm the analogy I like to use is like, I'm more of a, a cook than a baker because baking requires precision and measurements, um, but I like to freestyle it. Um, and so I allow that again with storyboards. So I think it's important to know like how you work best and also what your project is and what the expectations are. So you know how to, you know what to present, right? If you're working with a team that wants a very detailed, clean storyboard, then you have to offer that. And if you're working just with yourself or with a team that's more flexible, I love flexibility. So right now I'm working on a film project. I never know what to call it because the I think the commerce um, of filmmaking or like the you know the industry is so different than like the I, I record with my phone. <laughs> I edit on Adobe Premiere Pro on my laptop, and this is a new laptop. My old laptop is like nine years old. The rendering took hours, um, so it's a different level of production. I've worked with, uh, as an assistant editor for like a professional editor used in a, in, a, in a studio where we had multiple screens. So there's like different levels. I'm more for the DIY level, the have control, uh, creative control and space to like really imagine. 
Um, so for what I'm working on right now for Nocturne, I don't really know what's going to happen. All I know is because it's COVID, the people I wanted to interview, I couldn't travel to interview them. So we had Zoom conversations and I invited them to record, not themselves, but like their surrounding. Um, just 10 minutes of footage so I can draw from. Um, and my intention of, of right now, what it's looking like is I'm uh, laying the, the footage I want in the timeline and I'm going to have to find a way to make the audio make sense with the video. And so it's purely experimental and I'm so into it. <laughs> I'm so excited and also very nervous because when you don't have a clear goal, you don't know what it is. So that's fun for me. Um, do folks have any questions? Any specific questions? Any um, thoughts, comments? I'm just going to look at my notes. <laughs> I'm um, curious how, like, with the film you just showed, uh, how like was was focusing on um, belonging, like blackness and belonging. Like, was that something that you were, was it like an initial idea, or was that something that you needed to like work to over time? It was an initial idea because I had, um, I'll see if I can find a link here. I had made series of really terrible. Um, just very basic interviews with, with Black people here, um, just about their, you know, so Black people who come from elsewhere to Nova Scotia and Black people from Nova Scotia. Um, and so I, I knew that I wanted to be about a sense of belonging. And right. Um, so that was already there. How people responded to the questions or how they, what they wanted to share um, within that theme was, was entirely up to them. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to find, oh yeah, I'll show you the like previous version with Marge. So it was a few years because I, I, I did Black in, Black in Halifax in 2017 and had already established contact with Maje and already interviewed him once before. Um, and it's different, there's like such a difference in, in the two of them, even though it's still him, still being himself, there's, we went more in depth because we had had more time to develop trust. And that's just a link of an old interview with Maje. Um, yeah. mm. Um, did anybody else have any questions or thoughts? I do have actually, sorry, I don't mean to have all the questions, but I'm curious, like, um, I really like that you um, layered the interviews on top of them performing. Mm. Did you leave, like, um, was there something that, you know, even just somewhat specific that you were asking them to do, or did you just let them like me like do whatever it is you feel like you want to do on camera? Yeah. And I how did you plan your shots around that? I guess. Totally. I asked them um, what they wanted. Like, you know, they all had very specific crafts. Like, Marge is a musician, a writer, Leon is a dancer, a curator, and artist. And so I wanted a very physical performance I wanted to kind of engage with like physicality so even Marge I asked him to like perform new music and and at the time the magic project was like re like fairly new or you know it wasn't like now it's been a few years but at the time it was fairly new so I asked Kate to talk about that um but yeah folks had freedom to similar to like the queerness and faith project I did um they I had questions like, tell me about your faith, but please cook whatever you want. So there's a lot of freedom. Um, Cause I don't, I mean, the last thing I want is people feeling how I feel in front of the camera, which is like stiff and awkward. I'm worried about how, it, worried about if my words are conveying what I mean. Um, yeah. And sometimes people need, like I schedule maybe an hour and a half per interview, but sometimes it was three hours just for people to get comfortable enough 
in the space with the self, <laughs> which is why it was great to have them engage with their practice. So Liliana um, performed and then, wait, was it the other way around? No, no, Liliana interviewed and then danced and then went back to the interview. And so like that middle dancing of getting her in her body, just kind of most of what the, the interview I used was after she had danced and well, she felt more, you know, grounded. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think um, Kristen has a question as well. Yes, please. Hi, Francesca. First, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, this is amazing. That, and that uh, I'm, it was great starting with that, that footage. Um, I work with a, I work with an, with an incredible artist in the, we're just starting this, this adventure of filmmaking, which I totally love. And, um, and it's interesting, he does not have an art, art architecture background as I do. And I find um, I'm, I'm, I battle with this, and my question is, how much of a story do you feel you need to actually articulate on the screen? Like, my, with I'm having to kind of unlearn that I need to explain everything. I want everybody to be really clear what they should be knowing, what information is being, and he's just like, no, we're just going to like, he, he creates these amazing images, and we just put them out there, and people have, and make people actually do some work, and, and think, and, and leave it there which leaves me feeling really vulnerable, but I'm like, and having to like, you know, unlearn my education. But I, I'm so, I think it's so valuable, that process. But I don't really know, you know, but so I struggle with this, how much of the story do you actually have to tell people? And how much do you just leave there for them to, to think? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I always think about, did you ever watch The Dark Knight, the Batman movie? So it was incredibly violent, but I don't know if you remember that we they didn't actually show us anything. It was all suggested. I, and I was like, I don't know, I think I was I'm either my mid or early 20s, I don't really remember, but I was just so disturbed by the immense violence. And then I went back to look and I'm like, but I actually don't see anything. They don't show me anything. The suggestion was so effective um, and I think with storytelling because I what I would love to do with storytelling is just merge minds so you can just see <laughs> and so that means in my writing I'm very um, descriptive and I love it but not every reader wants that and I love there's some books that are so sparse where I don't know what the the protagonist looks like. I don't know where they are, but the story is strong enough. I'm the opposite. I want to give you everything. And similar with filmmaking, I want you to see everything. I want you to see people's hands up close. I want you to see their pores. I want you to get as close as possible. But, <laughs> but there's always room, I think, for alliance and suggestion. Um, I don't know if that makes even answers the question at all. Maybe it just comes down to style, you know, like there's not, and again, I'm speaking as someone who didn't go to film school. I don't know what the professionals are saying. Yeah. <laughs> I just, um, I'm mostly looking to elicit like a feeling of intimacy without saying too much, right? So up close without, in writing, I'm saying everything. But in filmmaking and photography, guessing you really close without actually saying that much. Um, however that works, like however you can figure out to make that happen, you know. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> it does. And I really appreciate your writing analogies because uh, that's more my background as well. I also haven't gone to film school or anything like that. And, <laughs> um, but we, our last film, we were given a 15 minute, you know, time a lot um, because we were screening it at, a, at an urbanism conference and and I and so to me immediately my brain associated like okay so now go from writing a novel to writing a poem and it, it became really interesting to think about okay what are the exact pieces just like you so carefully choose the words in poetry 
when, in, when writing poetry. And so I found it, but then like poetry, you know, some, some people totally get it and some people, you know, what you've written and some people don't. And, and uh, so uh, some people just like looked at our film with stunned silence and other people were just like, Wow, and, I, and so now I'm left with okay. Did we like totally get it wrong? Did, did okay. I immediately jumped to the we? We must have totally got it wrong. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I appreciate your comments. Yeah, no, I think that's a perfect analogy, like poetry versus a novel. Um, and um, some people just don't like poetry. It can be the best poem, the most beautiful provocative, whatever. And some people are like, poetry is not interesting to me. What are you gonna do, not write poetry anymore? Like you still have to write your poetry. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but for the people who dig it, like it, it can be so, I mean, sometimes I cry reading poetry and I show my friends and they're like, you're weird, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I guess like, I want to create things that move me or that mock me. I want to like, it's a, it's quite selfish. It's about me. <laughs> my work is about my enjoyment and my experience of it, <laughs> which, you know, different than if you're like making commercials, <laughs> then it's not really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that comment. It just, uh, yeah, makes, yeah, it just like, opens the door to freedom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's basically the point of, well, this workshop for me is like, what do you, what do you wanna do and how can you do it in a way that feels, not just feels best, not in, the, in terms of being comfortable, but like fulfilling or um, purposeful, you know, like what, what will, make you proud <laughs> of yourself <laughs> at the end like what will make you proud of your work even even when you don't have all the resources to you know the one of the interviews I put there the audio is terrible and um, there's a there's a feature on um Premiere Pro like warp if your sh camera is shaky which mine is and you can use this like thing to steady the camera but it warps images and makes it look trippy or like a dream if it's too extreme and that it's not good but I loved it because Maje was opening up to me and and I wanted that <laughs> I got what I wanted <laughs> um yeah oh someone has their hand up Yemi Shonoga hiya um Hi. I'll your camera in just a second Hello. Hi. Hi, fellow Nigerian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, happy belated Independence Day. Happy belated Independence Day. <laughs> Let me unraise my hand. Lord. Um, hi. I'm so happy to see your face. Like, wow. <laughs> Bless. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your art. I appreciate the space. And I just had like some questions really. Um, I am an actor by trade. I love saying that, it's my day job. <laughs> <laughs> I know not a lot of people can say that. So like every time I get the chance, I say it, mate. Um, and I am also now a writer and I find that writing film because I'm a theater actor predominantly, is quite a doozy. Um, I feel like I'm writing two parallel stories at the same time, one for the character and then one for the camera. And I don't know if that's the correct way to think about it, but since you just nodded, maybe. So I was well, what you said just made sense to me, I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. I was hoping you could like kind of speak more on that and the process of like a continuation. What happens when we go from pen and paper or keyboard or whatever and screen to actually bringing these stories to fruition? And just I'm I'm kind of I don't know. I feel like I'm like wandering in a beautiful white canvas with like you know etches of lines starting to appear. Um, 
but I've got no idea what, what is appearing or what's going on. And I don't know the next steps of anything really. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So it makes sense to me what you said, like a story for the character and a story for the camera, because it is two different things. Uh, it's like the, you want the camera to kind of be, well, it depends on what you want the camera to be, because the camera can also be a character. The camera can be an omniscient, all-seeing eye, or can just be somebody following really closely this person, and you're seeing what they're seeing, uh, what the character, really close to the character, you're seeing what the character's seeing. So I think that's like a great place to start is what do you want when people watch it, whose head do you want them to be in in their own head watching or in the character's head? Um, I'm trying to think of a movie that did that. It's okay. I don't think this is a great film. Like I'm not here being like, you must watch this. Um, but there's a movie called, it's by someone named, his last name is N-O-E. I'm going to pull it up now. It's very trippy. Filmmaker. So the word that comes to mind is like, I guess maybe a parallel story really, um, and not necessarily a separate one. How I write, I don't really, I just write. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I like, I, I've really tried to like do the like, here's the subject matter and like, here's the character. And it just never really works out for me. It doesn't go far. I get like a page and I'm like, it's dead is deaded like there's nothing can you to explain do. that can you tell me more i want to understand better what you mean um in the sense that like a concept will download into my brain um mm -hmm. and then i'll have to like voice note it and then i'll have to like transcribe it but to me to actually sit like on keys or with pen and paper and like write something it's just it's not really it's not, I'm not there yet, I guess, because obviously it's a skill and it's also a muscle to have your brain work in this kind of way. And like I read recently, like artists write for passion and <laughs> writers write for money. <laughs> they write every day because they have to, not because they're like waiting for like the inspiration to, like I said, download into their brains. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God acting is my day job because if I was just a writer, I would be broke. Um, <laughs> No, yeah, but I see. I really appreciate that you you brought up the the muscle analogy because, like, I also sometimes when I'm in the cafe writing headphones in the flow, I'm just like, this is so easy. Like, why don't I just do this every day? And then other times when it's noon I'm in, and I'm in bed pretending to work because we're working from home, I'm just like, when did I write? Like, how did I ever know? How did that happen? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I think it, it's like working out. I, I, it's terrible. I hate it. But but if you want to, as they say, I don't know, lift heavy, you have to lift. You just have to lift, right? The I'm sorry. I'm going like roundabout ways of talking about discipline, which I do not have. Um, but putting yourself, but discipline, that's in a hard, like, I must transcend myself and my flaws, but putting yourself in a position where, there's more ease in accessing that place. So I know cafe, a bar with headphones and my computer, I will write because in my head, I'm pretending to be a main character. Right. <laughs> and so I'm like the main character writes. So then I write, <laughs> but I put myself in that situation instead of in my bed. <laughs> I don't know, but I, you know, whatever I can say, if I can encourage you to write, like you have to do it. Like yeah. if it, you, you just, However, you can figure it out. The voice, I do voice notes a lot. However, you can figure voice notes or like uh, speech to text, whatever you need to do, do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Thank you for that encouragement. And then I was hoping that you could speak more of like tr um, taking that, taking what the mind has given and then making it into film mm -hmm. um, or a modality that is actually like, accessible to others and what are your feelings of kind of sharing what you make I, I guess because I've never actually like taken a piece and then like made it real like what happens do you just like vibe with the changes because clearly you're not like not clearly maybe some people with the millions of dollars like Rihanna <laughs> here. like it's just not going to be like, I don't know. Is it, is it what you envision in your mind? And how do you, 
I'm it's always I'm better. I'm different questions. I'm sorry. Start no, it's okay. Me. It's always better. Well, with writing, right? With writing, it's always better than I envisioned in my mind because I think editing, I think like the most important part of writing for me is editing. And so that's where you're really, you know, the analogy of Michelangelo, or sorry, <laughs> what's the name of the artist who did the sculpture? Michelangelo. And he was just feeling for this figure within the, within the clay. Marble. concrete marble and so when you write and then you edit the editing for me is like you're feeling for the story um and then you're getting surprised this is the part you get you don't you don't know what you don't know and you don't know how much more awesome your thing can be until you're met with surprises and then you can make a different decision I'm thinking very visually right now um but basically um you write something and when it's being read, if you're lucky, when it's being read by people who aren't your immediate friends, it's different because it's gone through, or when it's being read or being seen, it's gone through refinement, it's gone through like, you know, so I guess I try to be not terribly attached to what I have in my head. The seed of it, yes, because that's what will motivate me, but the everything else, they say sure. kill your darling. <laughs> they say you have to get comfortable killing your darlings. And I think even with ideas. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Yes. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for asking. Yes. Uh, can I have one more question? Am I taking up too much time? So sorry. No, I'm having a nice time. <laughs> oh, well. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and just like the, 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 I guess, the stage of like what happens next? Like what do you find your process to be in the continuation of? Well, it depends on, so like for this documentary that I showed you, I got a grant and then I got involved with like a program. Um, and it happened all very quickly. We made the film very quickly. And me and the other filmmakers on this program got to screen, screen our documentary. So that was like the end game was to show it at festivals. Um, and then some way, somehow, the foundation got it from CBC, but lump sum. So like that could be like, that's what you want. You want your film to be on a platform where people can access it. That's the end goal, right? Um, with writing, if you want to be published at the end, that's the end goal. It can be in an anthology. It's just with art, there's no guarantee. Um, am, I, am I understanding your question? Like what happens next when you create the thing? Is that the question? Um, it was the question. I was hoping for something like more technical, like, you know, oh. I've written it and now I take it to John Smith. And John Oh, Smith, yeah. You know what okay. I mean? Like, you know, like totally. just like a bit of like a process of that's, that's that's something following. Yeah. <laughs> so like as a de like as a novice, just a just a me person, I'm not with um I don't I don't know, a film company. So I make my thing or I have a script or I have an idea. I apply for a grant because you need money. Because you need to pay yourself. That's yeah. one thing I forget as like a, a DIY maker is I'm like, I'll do I'll spend six hundred hours on this thing and maybe I can show it at the art gallery one time. <laughs> like fine but I still have to eat you need to pay yourself so I think you write your thing you apply for grants even before you write your thing you just you can write a proposal you apply for grants those granting agencies where what's your location may I ask um I am currently visiting my parents in Edmonton Alberta but I just moved to Toronto a few months ago so okay not... yeah so there's the Ontario Council of the Arts there's um Canadian Can Canada Council of the Arts and there's National Film Board. So that's like three granting bodies that you can reach to to develop your work, right? You have an idea, you have a proposal, you can apply to, for grants to further develop it into a script. Grant writing is its own. Are you, <laughs> Laura, and, and uh, are you going to have a, uh, uh, Adria, are you going to have a workshop on grant writing? Because that's a whole other. Uh, yeah, idea. I was going to ask. Was Honestly, like, not a bad idea. I feel like <laughs> the, the conversations that we've had um, like which we've just been having some discussions with people about, you know, like filmmakers and stuff in their process and, and funding comes up every single time. 
and even like through like the non-film related stuff like the film is like this is very new for us but like it's how everything gets done and it's also like you said like so important to remember that um like it can be so much more than you like like you, you can have more than like working on it for 600 hours and showing it once like if you if yeah. you go a little bit outside of your shell there's yeah. so much more there's so many more platforms out there if you just put yourself out there and the worst that yeah. someone can say is no right exactly um and there's so much and the people who know how to like writing for grants is like a skill and I, it seems like a a good good uh, idea for a workshop actually yeah because you can get a grant to develop your script Mm -hmm. and then you can get a grant grant to hire either an editor or you know because I mean I love to pretend like I can do everything myself but you know it's better when somebody else edits my work if yeah and you don't have to do everything yourself you don't have to yeah you can hire an editor hire a film crew all of this comes with the grants oh there's another one and uh, uh, there's another granting agency for filmmakers specifically. I'll try and find it and put it in the in the box here. But yes, money. You need money. You have the idea. You need money to develop it, and not just the money, but like you need the time. So what you're doing with the grant, what you can do with the grant, is have that be your job that pays you. So you're not doing it between shifts, after shifts, after work, whatever. Um, so that's like one immediate next step you can do when you have an idea. It's just that step requires work <laughs> of developing a, a budget, a proposal, a kind of an end game, right? Yeah. I <laughs> so do imagine that to- that helps with some structure, though. Like, I mean, it maybe like sometimes working with structures um, at the beginning maybe is, can be restrictive, but I imagine kind of put, forcing yourself to maybe like make some kind of document where you're like putting everything loosely overall down on paper and making a plan. Um, I, I imagine it's maybe helpful. helpful to start. Yeah, I find like writing a grant actually gives me the structure and the timeline to produce the work. Um, and then you get paid. And then the next step after that, if you write a script or if you have an idea, you get a grant to develop the script. Your next step is, I don't know, do you want to hire a crew? Do you want to do like a table reading, which you, you hire actors and it's just like, you all sit at the table getting paid and read the scripts and imagine it, you know, and then next step another grant to develop it for TV or whatever, you know. Um, yeah. This answers the technical. Question, so thank you so yeah. very much. I'm so glad. I'm going to learn how to write a grant so I can get hired. <laughs> yeah, let me find the links now for all the grants that know that you could be, you know, people regardless of region could be eligible for. Oh, thank you so much. And if you like have any links for templates, that would be great too. (laughs) Templates, let me think. I actually think this is a great idea about writing proposals because it can be, I find even just like, you know, what is the acceptable amount to charge yourself that you can bill yourself and all of those questions, it becomes very intimidating. And so, and, and then reasons not to, not to do it. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's CARFAC, which is, um, I don't actually know what CARFAC stands for, but it's like the um, standard of payment for artists, um, different types of artists and different types of presentations or whatever. Um, and so if you're like, I don't know how much to charge because I had low self-esteem and I feel weird. I'm just making this thing. CARFAC, minimum, just, oh, just in fact, CARFAC plus like $200 maybe per hour. Um, it's a helpful way to know Oh, Carfax, I'll, I'll could you, throw the link could in you there. throw that in there as well? Because Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's um, really, really useful. And especially, I think, coming from the DIY, because I think we all probably undervalue ourselves because we're like, but we haven't been to film school and this isn't a professional project and, and, and. Yeah, yeah and I think it's it's easy to, to dismiss at the beginning, because but really like a lot of the, at least seems like the beginning of this this series is really about trying to give people the tools to like start making stuff for themselves. And I think it could be so easy to undervalue your work and the things that you the things you have to say. Um, and that funding a, a lot of the time is one of the biggest barriers of making stuff, right? And Absolutely. so giving people the tools to like be like, I have this thing that I really want to make, I'm really passionate about. I think I have something important to say. And then, but funding's usually yeah like the biggest barrier. And if you give people the tools to then start surpassing that barrier then so much stuff gets made 
Absolutely. Because there's, there's a lot of money just out there that people don't know is there. And you, all you need to do sometimes is just apply for it. and Just apply. And then overnight, <laughs> and then like, just on some chance, you're like, oh, now I have money and I can go make this thing I never thought I'd be able to do. So yeah. um, it's really great to be able to like, it, it's, it, it, it's not as like fancy as the creative stuff, but it's so key, right? But it's what makes the creative stuff possible. Exactly. And, and also free. And it lets you take care of yourself too, right? Like you you should exactly. you shouldn't have to like choose between eating and making things, right? And yeah. that's a lot that's a hard decision that a lot of people have to make. And you don't always uh it, it's nice to know that you don't always have to, right? Absolutely. Hopefully never should mine. have to. She really shouldn't. A friend of mine had to tell me, like a friend, I, I showed her my grants and she's like, You're not paying yourself. You're just doing all this for free. And I was like, yes, it's my passion. She's like, that's stupid. <laughs> she loves me. She didn't mean to be mean, but she's like, because the well, money it's true. is there. It's yeah. very easy to dismiss like the fact that you your time is valuable, right? And exactly. if you don't value your time, a lot of people aren't going to value your time either. And exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and you gotta like it's it's a it's a vulnerable thing to be like, I have something of value to say, but it's it's so important to assert that for yourself. And then there's so many possibilities that open up as a result. So many possibilities. And and sometimes, okay, what I find helpful uh, to encourage myself from being like insecure, well, from like, of course, feelings of feelings, but from acting on insecurity and fear is I think of the worst person. There's no, I don't know. This is a fictional worst person, but just like the worst annoying person who makes the most mediocre art. And I imagine them applying for a grant and getting it and then I'm like if that asshole <laughs> then I then me too which is not such healthy. good motivation being like <laughs> if that person like like I'm doing the world a favor by applying to this thing and stopping that guy from getting funny. yeah yeah so it's not very healthy but it can be helpful <laughs> it can be I mean it also is kind of reality it happens all the time <laughs> and it's true it's a lot of taking yourself seriously and knowing your financial worth of your work um so yeah I put the link to like all the <laughs> like, granting bodies I know but there's more yeah. to I mean, we can send time. out an email after this is done just kind of because you've posted so many great um resources and artists um in the chat so maybe we can send a follow-up email to this so everyone oh yeah all compiled and I think yeah. also as well as ourselves it's a way for um especially like some of us are in the privileged position of having a salary like as an academic or something and we work with people who it can become extractive if we don't take care that they're also getting paid like the artists who I work with or um, people in marginalized communities or um, that those people also get valued to to the extent they need to be and quite honestly in many cases that they eat um, you know so it's, I think for that reason also, it's really, it is really important that we take it seriously. And I, and I really do think I'd be happy to help organize that um, workshop on, on fundraising, on grant writing, because I, the more we talk about it, the more I'm, it's like sinking in that um, how, just how important this is for ourselves and the people we work with. Thank you for saying that, because it's true, especially if, you know, if you're interested in interviewing people, and if you're interested in interviewing people from marginalized communities, a good way to pay them because sometimes it, it can feel awkward, you know, like how much do I honorarium? Just say I'm offering an honorarium, which you would have written into your grant. I'm offering an honorarium of, I don't want to pay people honorariums less than um, a car fact, minimum car fact fee that I would ask for. And so an honorarium of like 250, 350, whatever. That for a half hour of talking or for an hour of talking, I think is good. It's, it's not the most, it can be much, much better because people are sharing information and ideas are inviting you into places that you may never have access to. So like, that's the bare minimum you could do is offer an honorarium. And when you have grant money, you can. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I hope this is useful. Um, thank you for having me. Exactly I'm very so. available to like continue have your conversation. So feel free to email me or message me. Um, I'll put my email address here. (laughs) 
Yeah, so please, I think that's correct. Yeah, feel free to email me um, if you just want to keep talking about making weird art <laughs> and getting paid. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's it. Is that it? Is my time up? <laughs> I mean, uh, we didn't really have a set amount of time. So if um, it's really, uh, this, was, this was your stage, so. Um. <laughs> well, if, if there are no more questions, I'll, I'll say goodbye. But thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Laura. That was incredible. Thanks, Francis. Incredible and wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that film with us also. And yeah, this was, it was a wonderful conversation and also a really wonderful interaction between um, uh, you and Yumi earlier. That was really nice <laughs> to see. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, Thank Douglas, you I think, has a, quick, Douglas has a quick comment, I think, yeah. before you go. Well, oh, yeah. uh Kristen, Kristen uh, first of all, let me thank everybody for today's workshop. It was it was much appreciated. And I really, um, for everybody who participated, it's, it's um, these are turning out to be a really informative set of sessions. So thank you for everybody for their time. May I say one more, uh, two more things? Absolutely. So I know for Arts Nova Scotia, for folks in Nova Scotia, there are programming officers that will sit with you and look at your application and give you feedback. So the, a lot of these um, art grants are juried by like peers, like other artists. So no one can guarantee that you get the grant. You can only do your best, but connecting with a programming officer is an excellent way because grant writing to me feels a bit like applying for visas. Like I'm Nigerian, I have a Nigerian passport, I need visas for every country. And if it has the same feeling of like, oh my God, will I get this? My, my heart, my hopes and dreams are on the line. Um, but a programming officer is really helpful. In Nova Scotia, the programming officer I've worked with is Enrique Ferriero. Um, but I don't know what it's like in other provinces. I can only imagine. Um, and then the second thing is the music I use in my documentaries. My brother is a musician, so I just use his music. But in general, you can't just like swipe people's music. There's like royalties, but I just Google like royalty free music and I put a link in to one website that I've used before. Um, but in general, if you have musician friends, uh, you should hire them and pay them because you'd have written that into the grant as well. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, it's all great advice. Thank you so much for your time and for, uh, for coming to present today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Everyone stay safe. You too. <laughs> Thanks, Francesca. Thanks, Francesca. Thanks so much for everything. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>